Hi everyone. Hi. Hello. Hi guys, thank you so much for agreeing to come and speak today. Santa and I are just getting ready. Um, and if you have any questions specifically uh, from the list of questions that Santa sent out, let us know, uh, especially via, uh, you can even uh, let us know anonymously on the uh, comment section. Okay, thanks. Thank oh. you. Can I ask a quick question? For Hi. Me? Hey, For can I, uh, this is Michelle. Do you mind if I just ask a quick question about logistics? Yeah, of course. Uh, this is Lauren, by the way. Oh, hey. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good, good. Thanks for coming on. Although, uh, you know, I'm sure you guys want to have more break before your intern year starts. We really appreciate it. Oh, of course, uh, but I'm so glad to be here. I, I really do want to talk to people about the process because I know it's helpful to talk to people who've been through it. Definitely. We're really looking oh. forward to it. We have 120 people signed up. Oh, um, my goodness. So, no yeah, we were only able to advertise for two days, so everyone's really excited. That's very nerve-wracking. <laughs> oh, not to, you know, not to scare anyone. Um, but, yeah, sorry, you had a question? Yeah, so when the slide comes up, I know it said uh, we're going to just pick a question on the uh, list. Sh uh, do you recommend we just like go in order uh, based on the slide and based on the order in which like you ask the questions? Or how, I yeah, guess, so, how does it work? So from my understanding, Santa will assign um, very few people, so either two to three people per slide. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, you guys can kind of um, go for it. Um, Maybe you would just rather me. have us kind of call your name. Um, I like guess a question and directed specifically to a member. Um, I don't know, because I'm sure like some people have more strong opinions for specific questions, but I hesitate um, to just like leave it open. I think maybe the best thing to do is have the two people you pick read, um, go through each question, like one down on the slide and like, 
they can decide which one they want, like who wants to answer which one, but like going from the top down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that sounds like a plan. So if there are, you know, two questions on two or three questions on a slide, hopefully Santa will call out two to three people. Um, and we'll just go by the order that she um, calls. Yeah, because it's just tricky because I'm sure people are going to want to start talking at the same time. Exactly. Um, so. Maybe and I would honestly leave it up to you guys. You know, you guys can kind of pick and choose. Um, so we'll have the three questions out. Let's say we'll uh, we'll call on Rin, uh, Michelle, and Millie, and you guys can kind of pick and choose which questions you want to answer from the list of three on a slide. Or if you want, just as another thought, um, if you wanted to just do go like one by one and ask the person like, oh, like Michelle, can you tell me about your experience with this? And then go to the next question and then ask, point point each person to a question. And then at the end, you can say, oh, of, of the people just that just answered, if anybody has anything else to add to any of the questions above, like, let me know. Or please speak up. And then before the people who... Before yeah. we move on to the next slide, you mean? Yeah. That sounds like a really good plan. Okay. Um, I will keep Santa posted. If any of you guys have an idea as to how you guys want to... Um, answer the questions, let us know. Santa's just kind of getting um, some te technical issue fixed right now. Um, but I think that's a really good plan. I'll keep her posted. Okay. It's just a suggestion. It doesn't have to work that way. Actually. No, no, that's great because we want to hear honestly from everyone, but we just don't have enough time um, for each of the questions. So yeah, I think leaving it open and seeing if anyone's really you know, passionate about a certain question and answer, um, I think that's a great idea. Cool.
Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Hi, yep. wonderful. Hi guys, this is Santa. I want to thank you guys uh, so much for agreeing to participate in this panel. I'm really excited to, to um, have this panel with you guys and learn from you and share that with the uh, other folks listening in. Of course, thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Um, so thank you guys also for coming in early. I'm trying to see if that's everybody. I think we might be missing, let's see. We're just missing two people. Um, I, Santa, I emailed Raina. Um, mm -hmm. She is logged in, but as an attendee, I did mm -hmm. send her um, a panelist email. I'm just reminding her to log in as a panelist. Awesome, thank you. And then I'm just trying to see, there's one more person, let's see. Oh, Megan Clark, I think, is not yet logged on, um, is the other person. Um, um, but I, she should have been uh, on that list. Have you heard anything from her, Lauren? Not yet. Okay, no big. Um, I'll also, send her a check-in email. Mm -hmm. Just as an update, we were um, talking about this while you were getting some technical things um, sorted out. Mm -hmm. So if we could, if you actually you could point a question to a specific panelist per question, and then per slide at the end, if you could just kind of open it up to anyone who would like to add. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think that would be the way to go. Michelle, did you um, have any other suggestions? No, the only thing I would caution is like if when we do open it up, um, then Santa would just have to like cut people off if people just keep like ranting and like add like more people, more and more people keep wanting to add. Just say like we're going to limit or you can just tell all the panelists now, like only mm -hmm. two people maybe can additionally add anything afterwards per slide. Okay. Your time. Um, okay. I so, think it's a great idea to um, to make sure that we don't have too many people speaking at once. Um, actually, Lauren, I don't know um, if it looks like my screen's a little different. I know you have a lot more experience with this um, setup. I'd like to share my screen just to show you guys sort of um, what I had in mind to try and uh, keep a balance between time, but also hear multiple perspectives. But I'm trying to figure out how to share my screen. It's um it's a little computer screen looking um, icon on the left corner. Um, let's see. I see a mic and I see a camera. Oh, okay. It should be right under the camera. Okay. When I hit that, I see RFS webinar competitive applicants panel organizer SIR staff. I don't, and I've lost sight of my own screen. Can you guys see my screen now? No. No. Okay. Wait, quick question. So you said certain people are answering certain questions. Is that correct? That's or correct. So, yes. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't share my screen. What I did was um, there's a couple major questions that um, I thought each of you could answer. There's only about four of those in the entire pod and the entire webinar. Excuse me. Um, those are ones where I thought it was um, very broad, and um, most of those are sort of things at the end of a particular section where I say you know is there anything else you would want to add and that's basically a chance for people who weren't asked a specific question to chime in if they felt they wanted to add something that wasn't brought up for all of the other questions what i ended up doing was assigning a group of questions to three people in a certain order um, so that that way you know for the for a single group of questions um three people would answer and and if you know by the time your turn comes up you say look i you know i think so and so said it all that's great um, what I wanted, I did really want to try and have um, as many people's perspectives as possible while minding the time and also not having multiple people um, uh, speaking at once. Can you all sh see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I wanted to give you a heads up, but I also didn't want to cut you off. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, here's here's what I was thinking. And, um, you know, if we need to change it, we still have 15 minutes. I can we can work it out. and I want to make sure it works best for you all, the panelists. So, for example, here, um, first question is. Um, the preclinical years. So I have sort of a set of questions. Um, so my plan was for pretty much each of these slides to briefly read the questions and then open it up to the three panelists that are listed below. So for this first question, it would be Megan, Shelby, and Daryl. Um, and so, you know, Megan would have the first shot at answering whichever of these questions she felt was she had the most to say about. And there's no obligation to answer all of the questions. There's no obligation to give a long answer to any of the questions. You can just, you know, say what you think needs to be said and and then you know, say that's it, and the next person would pick up and fill in anything else they thought um, was missing or that they wanted to add. The only then, thing yeah, I would sure. 
about? I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, no would be, they'd have to repeat which question they're answering, which is going to waste additional time because if you've already read them all out, um, mm -hmm. it might just end up taking additional time. Okay. Um, I was thinking that, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, who was speaking? I'm still trying to figure out the. Oh, sorry, this was Michelle who oh. said that. Um, so okay. maybe if you if you're open to this, like mm -hmm. just in the order you already wrote it, like Megan, Shelby, Daryl, like mm -hmm. Megan will answer the first one, Shelby will answer the second, Daryl will answer the third, and then afterwards you can say if, of the three people if they have anything to add for those other questions, like they can additionally add something. But okay. that's just a thought. It doesn't have to work that way at all. It's just to maybe I just didn't want to like have to repeat. All the questions. It's up to you. You can run it. Yeah, yeah. Or um, do you guys want to just pick and choose your own questions and read the question that you want to answer? Mm -hmm. Hey guys, this is Rana. I think I would prefer that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's that keep the order. Cool. Let's keep the order of the panelists according to the slides. But have you guys kind of have your first pick at the question you want to answer? Yeah, and then do you want us to read it out loud? Be like, okay, yes. so like just as an example, be like, oh, okay, so I'm gonna answer the question uh, that says during the preclinical years of medical school, studying for step one is important. Um, well, are there, are there oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 go, you were gonna say. Um, I was just gonna say, so that's actually, there's other slides that don't always have three questions each. Um, if if you all would prefer to read the questions, that's um, that's totally fine. So we I, the only um, the only thing I want to um, mention is um, just if the slide comes up, and I thought that if I read the questions out loud, that would help give you all time to think about what you wanted to say in response. And then you could pick whichever question you wanted to say. So for example, for away rotations, I could read, "How did you decide at which institution to participate in an away rotation?" Yada yada yada. And then uh, Millie, who would answer first, she could just say, well, you know, I decided to rotate at school X because of da da da. She wouldn't necessarily need to repeat the question. Okay, yeah. Or, or you can say like, oh, I'm gonna answer the first question or the third or mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah, that's yeah, oh, sure. Right. Okay, so we're changing now who's answering things. Um, I think for each slide, we, I think, um, let me, let me say if I think I, if I, what I think I understand and then if, you know, you guys um, have other suggestions or I missed something, just let me know. What we'll do is that um, for each slide, um, each slide has a set of questions on it, and then there's a list of panelists at the bottom. So the panelists are going to answer on this uh, slide. The panelists are going to answer in that order. So on this slide, for example, Millie would go first, then Catherine, uh, then, sorry, is it Rana or Raina? Sorry. Rana. Rana. Okay. Then Rana would answer next. And so when your turn comes up, when your name's on the slide, and you know that you're the next person um, on the list on the slide. You could feel free to answer any of these questions you wanted um, you, in any particular order. If somebody already, if, if you know everybody else said everything you wanted to say, you can just say, I don't have anything to add. Um, just sticking to the topic on that slide. What do you guys think? Sounds good to me. Yeah, I think it sounds good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, any other concerns, suggestions? Um, can you just go through and let us know kind of who's doing which slide? Really yeah, quickly. sure. I've yeah, the ones absolutely. Up, but not all of them. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Actually, so could you share those slides with our panelists? Yeah, good idea, guys. Um, so one second, that let me share. Helpful, I think. Yeah, definitely. Let me um, send. And, and there is a way for you to selectively share only um, that Google's uh, page. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just trying to, I, I de-shared just because I want to find the email I wrote to you guys, and let's see. Yeah, but I'll send that that link right away. Um, I think Shelby's not hearing anything on the webinar, she says. Oh, no. Um, hmm. She do, you have, do you see her on the She's not muted. I see her on the list. Um, yeah, she, okay. she is logged I'm in. Ah, uh, okay. So, yeah. So, sh what should I do? Because she doesn't hear anything. Hmm. Um, Lauren, can I forward to you I'm an email? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Santa, don't worry about it. I'll uh, try to work it out with Shelby and figure out um, the technical issue here. 
Okay, do yeah, you want I'm, to... I'm going to forward you an email from Charles, uh, Lauren, that's got some technical support stuff. Um, just basically a number to call, but I'm going to send that to you in case it's helpful. So, Daryl, it says here um, that Shelby isn't connected to the audio. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know. Like, I'm very technologically disabled. So I, so what do you want me to tell her? Do you want me to give you her number? Yeah, if you could Wait, actually message you. me her number. Um, <laughs> let me see if I can walk her through how to get the audio on. Okay, I'm just going to tell it to you now. Yeah. 813-951-7976. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys. Um, I'm sending out a link to the slides that should have all of the slides and everyone's uh, name. Uh, let me know if you don't if you don't get that, or if it doesn't uh, let you see what you want to see. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that that way, like, I'll know when that's perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm, of course. Um, so basically, I can walk you guys through the basic structure of the slides real quick before we start. Um, but what you see is uh, what it's going to be. So there shouldn't be anything surprising there. Um, so on the slides, basically, if you go to the webinar, actually, I need to share my screen. Oh, Tammy's still on hold. Not now. Not now. Okay. Okay, so if you guys can see my screen, um, so basically we're going to start, and on the webinar outline, it sort of says it all. So uh, to start, I'm going to very briefly go through the structure of the IR residency programs, uh, very superficially, just basically getting into what's the integrated versus the independent IR track, and also ESIR, just because I thought that that would likely come up at some point during the webinar if you all were talking about the different pathways and how you applied and so forth. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone listening had had heard about these different pathways before. So that'll be very quick. And then the next thing we're going to talk about is introducing you, you all. And um, so I have your photos here. I hope they all turned out well, and I hope I spelled every, everybody's name correctly. Um, so I'm going to um, briefly, I'm actually going to ask if you, you all would introduce yourselves. So um, the way I'm going to do that is if you could, um, oh, that didn't turn out right. um, basically, if you could uh, just say, you know, who you are, um, who you are, where you went to school, where you're going next year, and then how you decided that you wanted to do IR, sort of as the icebreaker. And um, at the bottom, it's sort of just who would go first, just to avoid people, you know, two people answering at once. And I put you guys in alphabetical order by last name, just to so see, you know, what the, how that ended up. Um, and then next, so there's basically two parts to the questions. One is the path to becoming a competitive applicant. So that's pretty much um, everything that'll come up about before the application process itself. Um, so it's questions just like you saw. So um, uh, th this one can be very, the ones where all of you are, um, I put all of you is ones where, you know, just um, if you have anything to add, that's great. If you don't have anything to add, you can just say, I have nothing to add. We'll move right to the next slide. Um, and everybody should have an equal number of chances to talk on the different slides. So we should be, um, you know, so if you have to, if you have something to say, that's great. And of course, that's the whole reason we're having the webinar. We really want to hear your guys' thoughts after you've been through this process. But you know, if some, if especially on a slide where there's a lot of people listed, um, if you don't have anything additional, just say, I don't, you know, this is this is Santa, nothing else, and then the next person will go. And then so similarly, we have the slides from before. So actually, would you guys? So in the end, would you guys prefer that I read the questions just to give you time to collect your thoughts? Or would you prefer that I just say, okay, now we're going to talk about the preclinical years and then here on this slide, Megan would just launch into it. What would you guys prefer? I think it still makes sense probably for you to read it. And then we'll just say, for the first question, my experience was X. Or for the second question, my experience was Y. Yeah. Oh, I'm unmuted. Hello? Yes. Hello. Okay, great. Thanks, Shelby. Yep, thank you. Glad to have you with us. Um, Thanks. 
Yeah. Um, Shelby, I'll give you the super brief run through. Um, basically, what we were talking about is the um, is the structure of, of the webinar and um, sort of how the questions are assigned to different people. So mm -hmm. there's going to be a very brief introduction um, of the residency program that I'll do at the beginning just because I feel like that topic's going to come up. Then um, I'm going to okay. briefly ask you to introduce yourself. So basically who you are, where you went to school, where you're going, and then um, sort of more personalized icebreaker, you know, how you decided you wanted to go into IR for your career, just so people, Perfect. you know, know a little bit more about you. And then after that, there's two sets of questions. Path to becoming a competitive applicant is about things that happened before you start applying to residency. And then the application trails, things that are happening after you, well, in the process of applying. So on each slide with questions, um, at the bottom there's listed a panelist name. And each everybody should have an equal number of slides. And so basically um, what's gonna happen is on each of these slides, I'm gonna briefly read the questions. And then whoever's first, so on this slide it would be Megan, whoever's first has first crack at any of the questions on that slide. If Megan wanted to talk about the second question, the third question, um, mm -hmm. whatnot, that, that would be her first choice. And then when, you know, she would say, you know, um, that's all I have, or that's it for me. And then Shelby would have a turn and could answer or add anything else that she wanted to add about that topic. And then Daryl would go, and it'd be a similar pattern um, for each of these slides. And so um, basically when it comes down to it, the questions that I wrote are meant to sort of just, um, just prompt you to share whatever advice you have on that topic. You know, if you come up, if you think of something that doesn't specifically ask one of those questions, but is about that topic, you know, we really want to hear what you guys thought was important and want to advise. So, um, and then there's a couple, um, so here, here we go. So at the end of the path to becoming a competitive applicant uh, section, at the very end, there's sort of a bonus advice section. Um, so, you know, for example, if you wanted to really talk about your research experience and you know, I didn't happen to put your name on the research slide. This would be a chance for you to say, you know, look, you know, I didn't actually get a chance to jump in before on that slide. I, I would like to add something about research or whatnot. This would be your opportunity to do it again, just sort of in this order. And again, it's just by alphabetical last name because I I can't figure out how to put people in, put people in a in a list. So, um, so but again, on this slide, you know, if you say, you know, if you don't have anything to add, you say, you know, no, I actually I, I have nothing to add. I have nothing to add, then the next person will pick up and then we'll just keep going like that. And after the last person has said what she wants to say, um, then we'll just move to the next part. So stuff before becoming, uh, stuff before applying, stuff during the application process, that's the application trail. Uh, so letters of rec, all that fun stuff. And then again, at the end of that section, we have, where are you? Da -da -da. Bonus advice. So, you know, do you have any additional advice for medical students applying? So again, if you weren't one of the three people listed to talk about letters of recommendation, but you really have something you think would be helpful to share. We really want to hear it. And this would be a chance for you to, ch to chime in about that. And then similarly at these end sections, if there's something that is very important about the application process, and I just didn't happen to include it as a slide, you know, feel free to, to jump in with that. Um, and then finally, uh, there's the last question, which I uh, sent you all ahead of time. Um, in, it's, it really hasn't changed since I sent it to you. So basically, if you feel like you have anything unique in your experience that, um, how shall I put it? I feel like for some of these questions, um, some of your advice might be for the general applicant, um, but we know that there's no such thing as a you know, super typical applicant. Everybody's a little bit different. So if you felt like your experience was had something that was a little different than the quote unquote typical applicant, um, this this is sort of where I wanted to highlight that. So if you had something where you felt like the general advice didn't quite apply to you, or you had a perspective that maybe not everybody saw, and um, this would be a great chance to share it, especially, you know, just we really wanted to make this panel speak to as many uh, listeners as possible. And so there's no typical applica uh, applicants. We wanted to give you guys um, a, a special um, time to, well, you can talk about it anytime, frankly, but wanted to make sure to leave space for you all to talk about things that maybe don't apply to everybody who's applying, but still should be talked about. Um, and then we have our last question. Again, we're just going uh, in the order on the bottom of the screen. Again, just alphabetical order. And then at the end, we're gonna have questions and answers. And again, I'm gonna try at least for my part, you guys should say, you know, say what you need to say. Um, we're being mindful of time, but the whole reason everybody's coming is to hear what you guys think having been through this. You guys are on the other side. And we're all, we all want to hear what you have to say. Um, so I'm going to be mindful for my part because they didn't, you know, they don't want to listen to my questions. They want to hear your answers. Um, and then at the end, uh, we'll have Q&A. And we'll just, 
I don't know. We'll see what the time is doing. Um, we won't run past uh, 930 because I know that's the time I gave you guys and I, I, I really want to respect your time. I know you're busy. So if Q&A and then a wrap up slide and um, that's it. Just one more thing. Um, it will be our session will be recorded today and will be uploaded on RFS YouTube channel in about a week. Okay, awesome. Um, oh, good. I'll put that in my last slide, Lauren. Thank you. And I checked with. I believe I heard from everybody that um, you all were okay with the recording. But if if I if anybody's uncomfortable with it, just um, let me know now. We should get started soon. Okay. Um, all right. So the. Um, one more, I'm sorry, Lauren, I should have asked you about this earlier. Um, recorded webinar will be posted on the RFS YouTube link. RFS YouTube channel, is that accurate? Yes. Awesome. And then the only other thing I wanted to double check with you, Lauren, just because you have uh, much more experience with this. Um, for the Q&A for the audience, what should I tell them in terms of sending in their questions so this would be a yep, chat you can even mention this in the beginning of the um yeah, definitely. Beginning of your presentation they mm -hmm. can send a private message to the organizer um the sir staff mm -hmm. okay go to webinar would that go to so that would go to you at least that it would, would be go to, yep it would go to me and mm -hmm. i will filter out um any redundant questions that would be great um and send a private message to SIR. So, mm -hmm. what and would actually, be the best way for me to communicate with you in terms of questions? I did share a Google Doc with you, but yeah, if that's thank too you. much, I can also text you the questions mm -hmm. as well. Or yeah, send so, you a private message. Mm -hmm. um, I think. So, I thought that I could share my screen just on my PowerPoint without sharing the rest of my screen, but I'm not sure I can see how to do that after all. So I think. It would be just safe for me to just private yeah, message privately. OK. You can actually, you know what? That that works fine. Also, Lauren, you'd be most familiar with the questions. If you would like to ask the questions, I can I can introduce you and then you can launch into the questions and then I can just quickly do the wrap up. Um, what do you think or how do you feel? I don't mean to rope you in all of a sudden. No, that's fine as well. I can do that. Okay, awesome. Um, Lauren Park, I'll introduce you as the MSC uh, chair. Is that is that accurate? I get all. I want to make sure I get the words right. Yep, that is that's accurate. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we're going to get started very soon. Any last minute questions, concerns? Nope. Okay. All sounds good. All right, and uh, let's just make sure everybody should be here. Um, Wonderful, so happy. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is, can you all see my screen and just just my slides, not, my, not the rest of my computer? Yes. Wonderful, all right, so um, I'm gonna launch the webinar, and again, um, I'll thank you guys at the end, but thanks so much. Okay, so I'm gonna launch the webinar now. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Santa Herwald. I'm the moderator for the Competitive Applicants Panel. I really wanna thank you for joining us. Um, so I'm eager to get started and um, help moderate this session where we all can learn from the wisdom of medical students, now rising uh, interns and residents who can tell us what it's really like to apply uh, to the IR residency program and what it's like to successfully prepare for it. So first I wanna go through briefly what the webinar is and how it's gonna be organized. So we're gonna start with a brief introduction to the IR residency program structure, just to make sure that we're all on the same page because this is a new residency program and there's lots of different pathways to enter into IR residency training. So we wanna make sure that um, we're just all on the same page before we start. Next, we'll go into introductions of our panelists who I'm very excited to, um, to have you all meet. And then we're gonna have two parts of the session where we're really listening to the panel. The first part um, is the path to becoming a competitive applicant. This is going to discuss topics that are relevant to somebody who has is not yet in the application process for IR residency. So things that you can do to strengthen your application um, before you're actually starting the application itself. 
The second part of this question in uh, this panelist session will be the application trail. So this is going to be where we ask the panelists to talk about their experiences while they were applying. Um, and then finally, we're going to have time for questions and answers from the audience. So I want to uh, make sure that I share at the beginning that there's a way for you all um, listening in to share your questions uh, that we'll uh, give to the panelists at the very end of the webinar. So the way that you can share your messages is if um, you all are in GoToWebinar. At the very bottom, there's a lot of, uh, lot of tabs. Uh, the bottom tab is chat. And so if you go to chat, you can see um, it says, you know, to, and you can pick it. Probably the default is that you would send it to everybody. Um, you don't have to. If you'd like to send a message in private, which might be a little bit easier for us to keep track of, send it to sirstaff-organizer. And these questions will be compiled to be asked to the panelists at the end of the meeting. So just something to keep in mind if you have a question that you want to make sure to ask that comes up while we're uh, not yet at the Q&A session. All right, so let's get started. I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the IR residency pathways. So um, as you probably know, there was a transition a couple of years ago to have the interventional radiology training no longer be a fellowship that diagnostic radiology residents did after they completed their diagnostic radiology training. And instead, now medical students can apply directly into a residency program that will provide interventional radiology training. So what I have here is a figure from the Society of Interventional Radiology. You can see the website here. Um, if you're not familiar with the residency program structure, I strongly recommend this website and other resources from the Society of Interventional Radiology that you can find online to help explain uh, this process. I know that I found it confusing when I was first learning about the residency pathways. So I'm going to go through this very, uh, very briefly, but basically what you can see here is that there's three main training pathways in IR residency. You have the integrated IR pathway, the independent IR residency, and this independent IR residency can either be with ESIR, which is early specialization in interventional radiology, or without it. And so the main uh, residency program that medical students are applying to directly is the integrated IR residency program. So what this looks like is that you apply to residency at the end of uh, medical school during your fourth year. You subsequently take an internship year. And then during PGY 2, 3, and 4, you'll be taking your diagnostic radiology training with some IR rotations, rotations integrated into that. So it'll be very, it'll be similar to diagnostic radiology training uh, for diagnostic radiology residency, but there will be um, extra IR, our IR training built in. And then during uh, postgraduate year five and six, there'll be two years of dedicated IR training. And so the total years of training is six years. Uh, for the independent IR residency, uh, it's a little bit different depending on the structure, the diagnostic radiology residency portion of it here. But um, in any case, the independent IR residency starts with an internship in the same way. And then during PGY uh, postgraduate year two through five, you're taking your diagnostic radiology residency. So really the choice here is um, if your diagnostic radiology or DR residency has an ESIR program or not. And you can see that if you take a standard diagnostic radiology residency program, uh, residency uh, training, that you complete uh, PGY2 through 4 in diagnostic radiology, or excuse me, PGY2 through 5 in diagnostic radiology, then have two years of IR training. And so that adds up to a total of seven years of postgraduate training uh, before you um, completed your training in IR. Whereas if you have the ESIR program at your diagnostic radiology uh, residency, then that integrates more IR into your diagnostic radiology years. And what that allows you to do is instead of having two years of IR training afterwards, you can qualify with only one year of IR training afterwards. So in the end, the advantage of doing the uh, of DR program with ESIR is that you would only have six years of training as opposed to seven. So uh, that's the integrated and the independent IR residencies and why you might be interested in finding out if a DR residency has ESIR because it might allow you to complete your training more quickly. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, and just uh, all of these panelists have applied to the integrated IR residency pathway. So where they apply to this entire training block immediately outside of, um, immediately out of medical school. Whereas in the independent IR residency, you apply to diagnostic radiology immediately after medical school. And then after, while you're completing your DR residency, then you apply again to the IR residency, the independent IR residency. 
So here you would apply just out of medical school, whereas with the independent IR residency, you would technically apply twice, once to diagnostic, and then after you've, when you're completing diagnostic, then you would apply to the independent IR residency. But our panelists that are gonna be speaking to us today apply to the integrated IR residency applying right out of medical school. So with that, I'd love to um, introduce our panelists. So here you can see um, our lovely panelists. Um, and uh, I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves um, to say their names, uh, where they went to medical school, where they're going next year, uh, to, or where they're going to do their uh, interventional radiology training. And then um, just so we can learn a little bit more about them, um, I'm gonna ask each of them to share with us how they decided they wanted to specialize in IR for their careers. Um, and just uh, for those of you listening in, it's sometimes I have difficulty distinguishing which panelist is speaking sometimes, especially because we don't have the camera. So what you can see at the bottom of the screen here is that actually the names of the panelists are listed. Um, so from left to right is the order of the panelists are um, going to address the different questions. Uh, just so you uh, know who's speaking, I know that I find that helpful. Um, so with that, I'd love to ask the panelists to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Megan. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Megan Clark and I went to West Virginia University for medical school and I recently matched at the University of Virginia for the integrated um, IR pathway. Um, and I decided that I wanted to do IR uh, early-ish on in my third year, I think it was around November, and I was exposed to minimally invasive image guided procedures on my vascular surgery rotation, but I liked the general surgery patient population um, as far as the pathology and all of that. So, and I was talking with a friend who was a year ahead of me in doing IR, and um, she basically, you know, when I was like, oh, I really like this minimally invasive stuff but I also kind of like the general surgery people better. I wish we could combine them. And she's like, there is that, it's called IR. And so that's uh, how I decided to do it. Great, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Sh uh, Shelby? Hi everyone, my name is Shelby Franz. I just graduated from Georgetown and I just matched IR integrated at Vanderbilt. I will also be completing my general surgery internship here. I was initially exposed to IR beginning of third year because Georgetown offers a two-week selective and so I rotated in IR, IR for two weeks. At that time I thought I was going to try to apply for just some type of surgical subspecialty, something where you can do a lot of procedures. I didn't really know a lot about IR at the time but I found it very intriguing and I worked a lot with the chief of IR during that rotation and he did a lot of research in IR. I knew research at that time would help me no matter what competitive specialty I applied to. So I started some IR research at the beginning of third year and just continued that on throughout the year. And it just um, helped maintain my interest in IR. And I waited until I did my general surgery rotation to help me better compare the two. And I met with the chief and the chairman of IR at Georgetown and just kind of talked about um, comparing general surgery and IR. and. There's actually a handful of people who leave surgery and switch to IR that I spoke with, and so it helped me make my decision. And then finally, I attended the American College of Surgery conference and the SIR conference, both because um, they were both happened to be in DC, which was convenient. But just being at those conferences and interacting with the different individuals in those fields and seeing what the latest research and technology was helped me make my decision. So, thank you. Wonderful. Um, hi, my name is Daryl Goldman. Um, I went to the University of Queensland Auctioner Clinical School um, and I matched into um, IRDR at Mount Sinai in New York City. Um, I first became interested, I, similar to the other people that have spoken, um, I was interested in general surgery um, prior to medical school and then, you know, I worked in Africa and wanted to do general surgery there kind of thing and um, then I spoke to a lot of patients and actually felt like IR was better for patients um, and so that's kind of why I fell in love with IR but I actually first became exposed to it in my neurology rotation and followed a stroke patient to go get a um, interventional neurology procedure which um, was really really cool so um, after that I was like just in just an awe of how fast the patient recovered and all of that so I think it was really the recovery that the patients go through after general surgery versus IR that kind of drew me to IR. So, yeah. 
Wonderful. Thanks, Daryl. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Millie Liao. Um, I went to Western University for med school and then I'll be at Loma Linda for IR. Um, for me, I found out about IR during first year of med school. Um, and since then, I was pretty interested in it, um, but I still kept an open mind throughout rotations during third year. Um, and pretty similar to Megan, Shelby, and Daryl, that like I was in between IR and surgery, um, but um, just seeing the, the difference in the patient impact um, that really swayed me. And then also, meeting people who are in IR, it's, to me, it's a different vibe. And, you know, these are going to be my colleagues that I'll be working with. So um, overall, that was kind of what led me to IR. Thanks, Melly. Uh, Catherine? Hi, my name is Catherine Panic. Uh, I just graduated from Case Western Reserve, and I'll be at Oregon Health and Science uh, for IR. Um, I think I'm the first one who wasn't interested in surgery um, out of the panelists mm -hmm. so far. Um, I actually came in when I do diagnostic radiology. Um, I had known about IR, but thought um, diagnostic radiology is just more um, more interesting to me because what I had been exposed to before med school was some pretty, um, I guess, more low key kind of stuff. My hometown hospital was kind of small, um, but then uh, getting more exposed in medical school kind of opened my eyes to, you know, the fact that they do some more high-end procedures that are really cool and stuff I, I was really interested in. Um, and it seemed to fit me more, especially during third year. Um, I kind of, you know, realized I liked working with my hands a little more. Um, you know, I, I liked my surgery rotations. I liked working with my, my hands and teammates and, um, you know, kind of being in a bit of an OR type environment, but IR was just kind of, you know, you know, just right, kind of like Goldilocks. Um, so mm -hmm. that's kind of how I fell into it. It just seemed to fit. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Rana? Hey everybody, my name is Rana. I went to Rosalind Franklin for, uh, for medical school um, and I'm going to UCSF for uh, surgery intern year and also the IRDR combined program. Um, I think I started liking IR for maybe the same reasons that teenagers might smart, start smoking. You know, the <laughs> doing it. Um, over the years, I met some people that were smart and laid back and I looked up to them and I noticed that they were going to IR and or they considered going to IR. So the field came on my radar in that way. Um, the reason that I ended up sticking with it is that I, as I learned more about myself and, um, and the field, uh, I realized that it's a particularly good fit for me. Uh, I like working with my hands. I like knowing something about the whole body. I'm not really ready to commit to a specific organ system or body part yet. Um, and I like interacting with patients, but not too much. Um, <laughs> and I like to be in the area of medicine. Maybe this is the most important thing for me, where there's rapid progress, where creativity is rewarded, and where there is tremendous opportunity for advocacy. And I think that's that IR uniquely offers all of that, and that's why I ultimately went with it. Wow, uh, thanks, Rana. Uh, Michelle? Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Schneider. I went to the University of Miami for medical school, and I will be doing both my surgery intern year and uh, my IRDR residency at the University of Michigan. Um, so I heard about IR my first year of medical school because my personality is just such that I like went to every interest group meeting that was available and IR was one of them. And I just really, what like was interesting to me was that the procedures that they were doing uh, spanned like so many different fields. And then I was like, wow, you can like access um like something in the body without opening people up in surgery like i never heard of anything that sounded so cool and so i kept it on my radar like uh, millie had said she had done um and then in my third year i, I and during that time i like went to a bunch of conferences and, and stuff both in like ophthalmology neurology ir um and then in my third year i went to an ir conference in um miami and they had a simulation booth where you can basically practice doing an IR procedure as like the primary operator. And I was, it was like a, a, a sim to clot off a bleeder in the splenic artery. And um, I was manipulating it on my own. And that was the first time that I really like was super hands-on. And I just like 
was so eager about it and I loved it and I was like oh can I do it again and like trying to get other people to like come over and like try this and so after I left the conference I was like yeah I could see myself like loving doing this and getting excited about it every day and so that's when I ultimately decided that that's my field. Wonderful. Um, it's it's one. I think that um, people listening in, if they are debating about IR, I think um, what all of you shared is going to help push more people, which makes me happy. Help push more people to think about IR. Um, and with that, we're going to launch into the panel itself and learn uh, learn from our panelists who are fresh off the application path or not path uh, trail. And so they've seen all of these things very recently. So we're going to start with the pathway to becoming a competitive applicant and uh, start very quickly with, you know, oh my goodness, I decided I wanted to pursue a career in IR, maybe after listening to your guys' answers. Um, so I'd like to quickly ask you, do you have any suggestions? What are the first small steps somebody should take if they realize they want to go into IR and they want to start preparing their residency applications, just in a couple words? Um, and if somebody already said yours, you, you don't have to necessarily answer, but uh, we want to hear everything, everything you want to share. Um, so I'll go first. I think it definitely depends on where they are in training. Um, obviously, a first year is going to respond a lot differently than a third year, but the first thing I would say would be to seek mentorship um, from people of all different stages in training. I had amazing mentors that were like resident level early out of their fellowship and like young attendings to well seasoned attendings and I think that each one of them provides a unique perspective um, on the process and can give you insight that others can't um, and so that's what I think the first thing you should do um, otherwise I'm not really sure. I think it's just very <laughs> dependent. Um, <laughs> no, that's great. That's a, that's a great first step, I think. Perfect. Um, I can go yeah. ahead. This is Shelby. I'll jump in. Um, yeah. So those are some great points. I, I agree. If you are a first year and have already realized you want to go into IR, I would go ahead and join SIR, free membership for students. Apply to be part of the Medical Student Council, the Resident Fellow Student Section. Um, get some leadership positions in that. Also, your school's IR interest group is something very important to get involved in. If you don't have one, start it. Um, or you can try to help coordinate some symposiums at your school. These are all things that show your genuine passion um, regarding the field of IR. Additionally, if you're later in the process, like late second year, third year, one of your first steps would probably be to schedule a meeting with the IR chief and chairman at your program um, and just to seek their advice and their mentor, like like Megan said, just to um, try to find a mentor and they can guide you throughout the process. And then lastly, um, something that I know a couple of us did throughout the residency application cycle is network and go to conferences. I know a couple of us were on Twitter. It helps expose you to the field of IR. There's a lot of attendings and residents on there that share cool cases and you can learn a lot about the field that way and make sure it's something that you're interested in and you can network and meet a lot of people. I'll let someone else um, expand upon that. Yeah, okay, wonderful. So, uh, so technically I'm next, but I think that you guys did a great job telling everyone what to do. I was, a um, just quickly, I was an IMG and actually, so my first two years in Australia, I had never heard of, of IR at all. Um, and then came to, so I heard about it late and I just want to say that I think it's really important to kind of do what Shelby and Megan said about um, different stages of when you're exposed to it. So I, you know, I was exposed to it late and I just kind of, you know, got on the bandwagon late. Uh, I wish I had learned about it earlier, but definitely do what they said as soon as you can. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Millie? Um, the only other things I would add was, uh, so if you're, Later, I'd say like if you're towards the end of MS2 or a third year, then definitely set up a rotation just to see what it's actually like um, to be in the field. Um, and then also doing some research. Um, research for me, the projects were definitely great, but it was also a way to network and develop those relationships with uh, attendings and residents. Great. 
thing I have to add to that um, is to talk to people a year ahead of a year or two years ahead of you at your school that have gone into IR or considered IR. I think they're wonderful resources. Start local, and definitely there's no reason anyone who is serious about IR um, uh, that they shouldn't join RFS or Medical Student Council. I, I think everyone who's interested in this field sh should be involved in RFS in some way. Yeah, I have to, quick, just quickly, just to add on that, every interview I had, they told me that the most important thing was like, are you a member of, of SIR? Are you like part of the RFS? I just think that that's really important and things that like, you know, if somebody else has that, it's just, you know, it's important that you everybody has that. I think, just um, to, oh, sorry. Sorry, um, just to round this out um i would say yes everything that everybody is saying is 100 percent true and perfect and i would have said the exact same thing that one other thing i would add um would be yes do all the the steps check all the boxes that people say you should do but don't just do it to check the boxes like find what within um every category that everybody is saying that you should do like research or um get, getting involved with like an interest group find what within that you actually really enjoy and pursue that because otherwise you're just going to be doing things that you don't like doing. And hopefully like you'll like it regardless because you're interested in IR, but just like find what you like to do. I think, um, sorry, I missed uh, jumping in earlier. Um, I think uh, just to echo that, um, something that I think residencies are looking for is, I mean, you know, you have an interest, but you have to show them you have an interest and whatever you, uh, you know, like or enjoy, whether it is research or SIR, going to meetings, et cetera, um, you just have to do something that shows them you're interested because you can be as interested as you want, but you have to, you know, be able to talk about that and kind of back that up. So anything you can do will help. Great. Um, does anybody else have anything else for this topic? We're actually going to talk about a lot of these things, uh, research, leadership, um, scheduling rotations in IR and DR. Um, okay. Um, so we'll go on to the next set of slides, but I think that was a great introduction to a lot of things that we'll talk about in more depth. And um, so I think that was a great start. So first thing we're going to talk about is we're going to start at the beginning, uh, the preclinical years for med medical school. I know there's people in pre-med now who are interested in IR, but we're going to start with the preclinical years of medical school. So everyone talks about studying for step one. So I'm just pulling from a paper that um, I actually highly recommend. You can see the citation here. And it's looking at um, folks who matched into the integrated IR program. So that's where you match at the end of medical school into both DR and IR, as our panelists have. And as you can see, the average uh, USMLE Step 1 score is uh, fairly high. It's about 245 uh, for the mean. And um, I know that, you know, that requires a lot of studying and work. And according to this study, um, a fair number of program directors use a cutoff for Step 1. Um, it looked like the average that they saw in this paper was um, 225. So as much as, you know, as much as we focus sometimes a lot on the clinical years, uh, the preclinical years and step one do seem to be important when we're talking about um, trying to make your application what you, all, you, all you want it to be and all it can be. So uh, the questions that I have for the panelists are, in addition to studying for step one, what other activities would you recommend during the preclinical years in particular before you start your clinical things? Um, and then what advice would you give to a medical student interested in IR who was disappointed with his or her step one scores? Is there anything in particular you would recommend? Uh, starting with Megan. Okay, so I think this is a great question. Um, I think that, frankly, there's not a whole lot you can do in your first two years um, outside of studying for step one that could make up for doing bad on step one. Um, so I would devote pretty much all of my energy to studying for step one. That's kind of what I did. I would do it again. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't do a whole lot of, I had nothing to show extracurricularly for my first two years. Um, if you can make it work and you're just a baller and can <laughs> do it all, then you should definitely do that. But if you are stretched thin, I wouldn't, you know, get a bunch of volunteering hours or like try to do a bunch of research and then get a 230 on step one like that. I think that your time 
in my opinion, is best spent on studying medicine and learning how to apply it, because not only are you studying for step one, but you're also learning how to do well in your rotations. If you know step one material, you're going to crush your rotations, and that's, you know, what's going to make you competitive for IR in any specialties. So I think in the early years, the main thing is just study hard and do what you can. I don't really have any other recommendations because I didn't do anything else and I couldn't do anything else. Um, and then advice for what I would say for people who are interested in step or interested in IR but are disappointed. Um, I think that obviously depends on your expectations. Um, if you're, you know, in the 240s, um, I would definitely say still apply to IR and um do what you know you can um if you get below <laughs> that or whatever your advisor says um i would definitely pursue the dr route and um boost your application with um doing really well on your clinical rotations because that's very important um for especially for ir um, and then, you know, research and, um, stuff oh, yeah. like that. But other than that, yeah, no, <laughs> you're covering, counts. Yeah, oh yeah, step two counts. You're covering, you're covering, uh, you're doing, you're covering a good stuff, a good amount of stuff we're going to co cover later. So you're like ahead of the game. Megan. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 oh. it's perfect. It's perfect. So, um, it's a good segue. Um, Sh Shelby, do you have anything to add for pre clinical yeah. years? Definitely. So I think Megan and I were a little bit different. I am always someone that I think I have to have my hands in a lot of different pots. Um, so I might have even over-involved myself in the first two years and didn't commit as much time to step one because I didn't do maybe as well as I had hoped because um, I was volunteering. I held some leadership positions in some clubs because I was initially interested in ophthalmology and I had um, some other surgery research from the summer after first year. I do recommend doing some research um, the first summer after first year because most schools you have all that time off and it's a great time to get a project in if you do know what you want to go into. Um, so I recommend doing that. But yes, otherwise you really should focus on studying for step one. It's extremely important given the competitiveness. But um, just to expand upon that a little bit because I wasn't as pleased with my step one score, I tried to remedy that by getting very involved in research, maintaining a good relationship with um, mentors in IR at my institution. That way they got to know me very well. I worked really hard on my home IR rotations. That way they could really um, give a lot of detail about my daily work ethic. And I think good letter of recommendations go a very long way in the residency application process. Additionally, if you feel like you didn't do as well in step one, um, Georgetown lets us schedule a study month early in our fourth year. So I had a study month in August and took step two at the end of August. That was early enough that I would get the grade back to be able to submit it right after we submitted ERAS applications. So you submit ERAS September 15th and I got the grade back a, like a week or two after that and could update all of the programs with my improved step two score. So that's a way to kind of remedy um, a step one score that you weren't so happy with. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Daryl, do you have anything to add? Um, I was just going to, like, I agree with both of those two as well, but I would say that, um, and we're going to talk about this later, so, but I think away rotations and as well as doing really well on your rotations at home are really good opportunities to just improve on that. Um, I think it's, yes, I think step one is important, and yes, I would advise to study as hard as you can for it. Um, but I think that there are other things that are very important as well and that you can make up for it. So I just want to say that. Okay, wonderful. I think you all covered that really well. So we're going to go through two years just like that on one slide and now uh, talk about uh, the clinical years. So just in terms of general scheduling for IR and DR rotations. Um, so um, for the panelists for this slide, um, how many rotations did you take in IR and DR? Were they home or away? Um, and how many would you recommend in, in each of those different uh, fields or, or locations, you know, home versus away, IR versus DR? And when would you recommend scheduling these rotations during the course of your third and fourth years, assuming sort of a traditional schedule where the clinical years are the last two years, uh, starting with Shelby? 
Okay, so I had the two weeks elective in IR during third year. That's really all we had at Georgetown. Mm -hmm. I know every med school is a little bit different when you might get some early exposure. If you don't have an early rotation, I would try to shadow on the weekends or whenever just to get some um, face time in with the department and make sure IR is for you. Um, I did a home Georgetown one month in IR in September, like the entire month of September. And then I did an away in California in IR because I didn't have any ties to the West Coast and wanted to open up that area to show my genuine interest in moving there for residency. And then mm -hmm. finally, I did an away um, in Florida, which is my home state. And that was from October 23rd to November 19th. And so that's on the later side. I feel like most students were done with their aways. But like mm -hmm. I said, I put a study month earlier. But I didn't feel like it was too late for an away. And it was nice because it was kind of around the interview time. So I interviewed at that institution during my way. Oh, and then I definitely recommend doing away rotations because IR is just getting so competitive and there is nothing like you being at an institution for a month, being the first one there, last one to leave, and them seeing you on a day-to-day -day basis, seeing how you work um, like in a team setting, your interpersonal skills, that's just invaluable and can't be compared to a paper application. Hmm. Um, okay, I just want to make sure you're done. Okay, so um, yeah, I, sorry, <laughs> you're fine. So I similarly, I didn't have any kind of two week selective, so I did a lot of shadowing during the weekends and also during my vacation time. Um, and then I did a uh, rotation. I mean, I guess it was technically DR at my home institution, but um, I mostly hung out in IR that time during that time because like the PD was an IR and and also just I was really interested in IR so I spent a lot of time in IR during that month at home and then I did three different aways so I did an away at Vanderbilt um, University I did an away at Emory and then I did an away at Sinai where I matched um, and when I went to Sinai it was actually after kind of really at the end I mean I started during this this December so um, I thought it was too late, but I basically just went there and was like, I'm, I'm not leaving. So I think that's kind <laughs> of, <nice. laughs> um, I would really recommend a ways. I think it's really important. Again, if you had a bad step one score or if you had bad anything on your transcript in a way is a really good time to get FaceTime and get, let them get to know you, um, and impress also, um, yeah, a ways I think, are we going to talk about where to choose a ways later? Uh, a little bit. I'm trying to remember. Um, if if you want to, yeah. okay. I'll just touch on it briefly. But I would say, you know, you know, you can choose your aways wisely as well. Like I knew I wanted a certain place, so I chose to do an away there. Um, you can do that as well. You can also do it where you th you have mentors. I had worked with someone at Emory previously on a symposium that I had organized at my home institution, and so I went to Emory to do an away kind of with them. Um, and yeah, so I think that's it for me. Mm -hmm. um, One other thing I could just add real quick when choosing a ways, if we don't talk about it later, um, it could be good to vary it. Like if you pick a very prestigious institution for one away and then choose maybe more of a middle tier one just to kind of space them out. I also learned um, during the process that some places, when you do an away there, even if they had like a step one. Um, screening, they'll waive that sometimes to um, give people interviews if they saw how you performed on your way. And just quickly, like aways can also hurt you, so you have to be very careful, okay? <laughs> True statement. <laughs> Uh, and we'll touch we'll touch on that in uh, maybe a more detail also. That's it's a great point. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about a ways uh, just in a couple of slides, but that, it's an excellent point, and I'm glad you all are talking about it. Um, Millie, do you have anything to add? Um, so for me, um, so I'm a DO student, and we didn't have a home institution. Um, so for me, and especially since I got interested in IR early, um, I set up a elective at the beginning of third year. Um, and then during fourth year though, I set up four aways, um, similar to what Shelby said, kind of just scattered my options um, geographically because I wanted to be open to going out of state. Um, but I rotated at 
um, Christiana Care in Delaware, Penn State, UW, and then Loma Linda, uh, which is where I matched at. Um, and two out of those four actually did two weeks of IR and two weeks of DR. Um, in hindsight, I think the DR was a like if you don't have an elective set up in DR by your school, it's a good experience to go through because you're eventually going to go through a lot of DR training. Um, but in terms of doing a ways in DR, I would actually would kind of cap it at two weeks if you have to, um, just simply because it's pretty difficult to impress as a, you know, as a student on DR. Um, but definitely for IRs, like the ways make such a big difference. Wow. And uh, just a quick follow up, did, uh, did any of you three, Shelby, you mentioned you did the two week IR um, rotation at your home school. Uh, Daryl and Millie, I'm trying, did you do an, a home rotation before your aways? So um, I did do, yes, I did a home rotation before. Uh, no, sorry. I did a home rotation after my Vanderbilt away, but before my other two aways. Um, but I, again, had like done a lot of research and shadowing with my home institution. So I knew a lot about IR before I did aways, which was really helpful. Um, and for me, for me, as a DO student, we actually don't have a, my school didn't have a home institution attached to it. So um, I kind of had to piggyback off of Kaiser and kind of treat it as my, in a sense, a home, I guess, institution. Okay, okay, gotcha. I do think that the home institution month, if you do have it at your school, is um, very valuable because it preps you to go on your ways and having that month with your home institution helps you um, establish a relationship with them for them to write you a letter. Okay, um, we're gonna actually dive a little bit more into the rotations. You all have already um, brought up some really, really important points. Um, so first, uh, talking about the rotation itself, uh, I think we started to talk, I think that was a perfect transition. So. Um, how to what to do on your, during your rotation. So what would you recommend for the best way to prepare for an IR clerkship or a DR clerkship if that's what you're doing? And how do you get the most out of the clerkship while you're there? And do you have any specific recommendations if you're hoping to ask for a letter of recommendation based on this clerkship? Um, starting with Daryl. Okay, so um, the way that I prepared was really learning about like clinical indications and the pathology associated with the various IR procedures that they do. Um, I think a lot of med students or a lot of med students that I rotated with on my OAs really concentrated on the actual IR procedures. And never once was I expected to know anything about an IR procedure itself. However, I was expected to know a lot about the indications for the procedures, the workup, the management, you know, post-op, all of that kind of thing, seeing patients in clinic. Um, that stuff I was expected to know, and that's the stuff that I think really benefited me that I had prepared. Um, there is a good textbook called Handbook of Interventional Radiology, Radio, sorry, Radiologic Procedures. <laughs> it's by <laughs> Kandarpa, um, Krishna Kandarpa. Um, I had that on me kind of at all times. That helps with the actual procedures. Um, that helped a lot. So. Yeah, but as far as like when I, so that's kind of what I did when I, beforehand, when I got there, the best way I think to really like immerse my, to do well was to immerse myself with everything. So again, like, you know, really get to know the fellows, you want to round on the patients, treat it like a surgical clerkship. So you want to, you know, pre-round, you know, read about your patients beforehand and procedures and then, you know, their care after the procedure. You also want to um, again, know all of the indications. Um, if you can, try to take call with your team. Um, I, that can be kind of annoying, so you have to be very like careful because you know you're you're not actually adding anything to the call team, right? Because you can't do anything. So yeah. you want to kind of approach that with care and not be obnoxious, but you can um, sort of talk to the fellow that's on call and, you know, give them your number and try to be on call as well. Um, it worked mm -hmm. on a few of my rotations and then not on a few as well. So, you know, don't take it personally if it does not work out. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, what else did I do that 
I think that's mostly it. I, you know, I asked to do case reports, stuff like that, just really got involved if I could. Um, mm -hmm. Ask a lot of questions, but again, I mean, everyone says to ask a lot of questions. And, you know, I went to all these symposiums where all of the doctors said, ask all these questions, but it's like every other rotation. And I think med students know better than attendings when it comes to asking questions. Like, again, don't be annoying. Um, and yeah, that's really it, I think. All right. Yeah. That's, that's great. That's a lot of um, <clears throat> very specific stuff. Um, that's very helpful. Um, yep. Emily, do you have anything to add? Um, just in addition to all of that, uh, one of the golden pearls that I got actually was to learn how to be a scrub tech. So I think th this would actually be good for you to learn on your home institution before doing the OAs. Um, just basic, you know, wire handling skills. Um, and I actually had a couple times uh, on my rotations where either, you know, we were short staffed um, or I ended up being like a first assist um, and the skills just really came into uh, good use. Um, and a lot of times also like attendings or fellows, they actually might not let you touch the patient at all, but a good way to show them that like, you know, you're really serious about IR and you're, you have some of the basic skills is actually just to work the back table, you know, fill the syringes, um, and being quick and efficient at that. Um, and on a ways also, um, for me, it was a good network to also build. Um, so that relationship, a lot of times I would try to jump on certain research projects um, and it was just more so to, to have another um, point of, yeah, building on your relationship with either the fellow or the attendings there. Wonderful. I think you all are bringing up very, uh, very valuable things. Um, Catherine, do you have anything to add? Sure. Um, I think everything Daryl and Millie said, uh, absolutely true. I had that interventional radiologic procedures book on me as well. Um, it's super helpful and has some uh, pretty um, succinct outlines and stuff, uh, even about like the procedures themselves. That's very helpful. Um, and then also trying to be the tech is definitely helpful. Um, I was able to be first assist on a lot of cases. Um, I did have the privilege of being at a big institution though, where there weren't, uh, you know, like the attending to fellow ratio was in favor of more attending. So I kind of had, um, I was kind of privileged in that way. Um, but I think um, along those lines, if uh, trying to round out the slide, just thinking of getting a letter of recommendation based on the clerkship, um, definitely be very present, ask questions that you, um, you know, are actually interested in that could become like talking points for the two of you, you know, you and the attending. Um, and then also try to stick with one attending if you are at a bigger institution. I think that was the main thing that allowed me to get some letters of recommendation from my IR clerkships, just, um, you know, kind of the first couple of days going around uh, seeing who I worked with best and who, you know, seemed to be willing to give me a little more uh, independence in the room and then kind of sticking with that person, even if it wasn't necessarily, um, you know, cases I was super passionate about. Um, I ended up doing like a ton of Y90s and they're super cool, but um, you know, maybe not something I wanna do with the rest of my life, but the attending was awesome. Let me get very hands-on and was a great person to just kind of make conversation with during the case. So um, kind of uh, keeping an open mind as to what kind of cases you might find interesting um, and trying to figure out who you connect with would be, a, I think my, uh, pieces of advice, I guess, for getting letters of recommendation. And then I think the only other thing we didn't touch on was preparing for a DR clerkship, um, which I did a couple of those. I think the main thing, honestly, is knowing what modality for which uh, presenting symptoms is a huge thing. That's a thing uh, I think a lot of residents will ask if you're sitting at the um, at the desk with them, just since they know you're not gonna, you know, like find a, a rib fracture or something, but they do know that if you don't do you know radiology um and you you know during your intern year have to order an imaging modality for someone who comes in with x y and z you should know what to pick so that's kind of a, a common question from them um and a good thing to just uh kind of look over before a dr clerkship i'd say mm -hmm. wonderful yeah thank you for rounding that out catherine yeah. um moving right along i know we talked a lot about away rotations already so 
Um, the basic questions that um, I'd have prepared ahead of time is basically how you decide which institution you want to go to. Um, if you felt that in a way rotation helped you at your at a particular school, a particular geographic region, although we, we sort of touched on that already. And if you had any um, special advice particular to an away rotation compared to home, although I know we sort of touched on this already, but if there's anything that we haven't discussed already um, about away rotations, um, uh, we'd love to hear it. Um, so for me, in terms of picking where to rotate at, um, I have a pretty extensive history of being in California. Um, so when it came to application time, I wanted to show that I was very much willing to go out of state. So I had stacked most of my away rotations um, just out of state. And also I was trying to get mostly the time frame aligned. Um, so I knew I already had my date set for my uh, Delaware rotation. So I needed to find another institution that was kind of around, you know, that East Coast area um, so that I could tack on two aways at the same time. Um, so that's how I kind of approached things was um, by geography and then also the the time frame. Um, and I mean, I guess for me, it, fortunately, I ended up in state anyways. Um, <laughs> didn't really make that much of a difference. Um, in terms of any other advice for away rotations, um, I'd say be prepared to be tired also, um, just because um, you're going to be bouncing, you know, at different hospitals, different institutions, you're going to have to learn the new system, um, meet new people. Um, Fortunately, on my end as a DO um, during my third year, that was pretty much my whole entire third year. I was like moving month to month. Um, so in that sense, I was already kind of used to the grind of picking up and restarting. Um, but just be aware that if you're going to stack multiple uh, aways back to back, you're going to be you know, tired from having your A game the whole time. Gotcha. Uh, Catherine, do you have anything to add? Sure. Um, so, kind of in a, a so case is uh, affiliated with three different hospitals here in Cleveland. Um, so I actually didn't do any away rotations. I just did rotations at um, you know the different. Uh, there are two main academic centers, so I just did rotations at both of those. Since I mean we kind of had a, a home institution, but things are um, shaking up a bit, so we're kind of affiliated with all of them fairly equally at this point. Um, so I kind of just also had some other. <laughs> funny my, my story is a little funny um i really thought i wanted to stay in cleveland my husband works here um we thought we didn't want to move uh i also thought cleveland clinic would be getting its ir um, integrated pathway uh up for our application cycle that didn't happen and i really wanted to do an integrated one so then we decided to move but that was later in the game so initially i thought i wanted to stay in cleveland um solidly so i didn't do any aways um but it ended up uh, I guess I can give the perspective of that, which is it didn't really, I feel, hurt me. Um, I did get interviews from other areas of the country, you know, from some from the South, some from, you know, Midwest, East Coast, West uh, West, and West Coast-ish. Um, so it didn't, you know, drastically hurt me, but um, I, I probably would have done some aways um, <laughs> had my story been a little different. Um, but the other thing, I, I kind of feel just... Um, as far as scheduling, doing them early if you do need uh, letters of recommendation is a good idea. Um, and I kind of would say, I think most of the applicants here had said they did a, a home institution, a rotation before in a way, um, which is probably, you know, people from your home institution probably have known you a, a little better, or at least know that you're coming from a reputable school that they're affiliated with, um, and would be probably more willing to write a letter of recommendation, or at least, you know, wouldn't be quite a, as up in the air, um, I would think. So that would be a good reason to do a home rotation as well before in a way. That's it <laughs> from me. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. And so. All right, guys, I can I can add a few more things. I mean, uh, I think this everyone's covered most of the kind of the most of the pearls on this topic. Um, in terms of how I chose always, I chose based on geography. I'm from the East Coast. I went to school in the Midwest and I wanted to go to West Coast. So I did my always on the West Coast. I started with Kaiser LA because um, having a mentor there, Dr. Vatican Cherry is there. And it's a very friendly environment for students. Um, you get a lot of hands-on opportunities. 
Um, then I did a rotation at UCSF where I ended up, um, and also an IR rotation at UCLA, uh, which I really enjoyed. And I did a DR rotation at UW. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, so I think that's great because the way rotations are in a lot of our minds. Um, so another thing that we talk about has already come up in, in your guys' advice is research. So uh, were you involved in research? Do you feel that it was helpful? And what advice do you have for somebody who wants to get involved but isn't connected with a mentor or who simply wants to get the most out of their research experience? Uh, starting with Catherine. Um, so I was involved in research. Um, I did feel it was very helpful for my application. Um, I did what some of the other uh, panelists here have said, which was get involved early on during that uh, summer after my M1 year, um, which is also kind of how I found my mentor. I had reached out through um, Case's alumni network. Um, they have kind of a, a way you can do that online. Um, so that was really helpful for not only finding a mentor, but finding someone who was from Case and kind of was, you know, a good connection off the bat. Um, but it was definitely helpful uh, just because it was a lot of a lot of talking points come up um, in interviews about it just since I had done a couple of different projects um, none of it I mean some of it I had I had done posters about but um, none of it was published in a journal just to um, state that off the bat too um, you don't need to have something published in a journal um, but it was definitely helpful to get involved in uh, any kind of research and I think if you want to get the most out of your research experience, um, working with a resident is probably the best way to go. I've done a couple of projects where it's just me and an attending versus me and, um, you know, kind of working through a resident and an attending. Um, and it's um, a lot more meaningful, I think, when you have a resident who just has more time to, to dedicate or at least is, you know, in the hospital enough that you can meet with them more often and things like that, um, I think really gave uh, me a little bit more out of my experience when it went that way. Um, if you aren't connected to a research mentor, I do think, you know, if your school has some kind of alumni network or advisors, um, reaching out to them isn't a bad idea. They typically know at least, um, you know, who is willing to work with students a little more than um, than some, you know, other students you might talk to or so, something like that. Um, but also talking to other students, you know, through the IR interest groups or things like that may have done research projects to get you um, at least connected uh, with someone who's willing to work with students as a starting point. Um, and then I know um, SIR also offers some opportunities. Um, I didn't personally didn't take advantage of them, but I know they're out there and maybe someone else can speak more about that. Um, but there are some ways to do research through um, like the, uh, oh my gosh, like the the, comp the the medical companies that make the, um, the product, oh my gosh, I don't know what, why I can't like think of the right word, but. <laughs> the, ven the vendors? Yes, thank you. Um, those companies offer research opportunities as well. So that's another good place to look. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Rana, I, I, is, how's your mic? Are you? Um, I'm not sure. Can you guys hear me? Yes, you're perfect. Excellent, perfect. Um, so my strategy for research is that I was very kind of vocal that I want to do IR um, during the second year. And I found, uh, you know, I was asking around and who's doing a research project and with who. Um, amongst the M3s and M4s in my class. And uh, that's kind of how I got plugged into my research project. And um, it ended up being really fruitful. Um, and I wanted to do academic medicine. So I think especially if you're interested in uh, pursuing academia, um, it you know, since so many people on the interview trail say that they wanna do um, pursue academic medicine, uh, it would really help if you can actually demonstrate that um, and demonstrate that by having done research, done publications, um, and definitely go to lots of conferences um, and present your research. And, and as many people said, that's an amazing opportunity for networking. So I would even, if you want to do academia, I would uh, strongly advise you to find a research mentor um, and do as much research as possible. Uh, if you are not interested in academia, I think research is a great thing to do uh, a little bit of so that you can present go to conferences at network okay so um i would like to add that as as important as doing ir research can be to show your interest in ir the research you do does not have to be an ir and um so i'm actually in the md mph or i was in the md mph program at miami um and so a lot of my research was actually in public health 
And uh, that was a big strength to my application because um, almost every interview that I went to, the focus of conversation was less on maybe my IR uh, work, but a little bit more on like the work that I did and the research I did in uh, public health. So even if you did research in something else, uh, it's still going to be viewed as a strength, and if anything, it'll, it might make you stand out a little bit. So don't be uh, afraid if you're, the research you've already done is in a different field um, would be one thing. And then in terms of finding where to, uh, how to get access to research projects, just find a good mentor would be my best um, advice. Like, it doesn't matter what the topic of research necessarily is. Yes, of course, it'd be great if it's in something that you're interested in. But I found that if you find a mentor that can really teach you how to do research like well from beginning to end, your life and future life in research will be just so much easier. And then you can decide which topics you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent point. And moving to another topic that has already come up uh, as well as research is uh, leadership in IR. Um, so just as a full disclosure, I, uh, all of our panelists have been uh, involved somehow in the uh, RFS or the MSC, that's the Resident Fellows uh, Student Section or the Medical Student Council. Uh, so I'd like to also ask the panelists for this slide, you know, were you involved in your local IR interest group? Do you feel that these, it's come up a little bit, but do you have anything to add in terms of how helpful these experiences were for your application? And do you have any advice for a student who wants to get involved or who wants to get the most out of this experience? Um, if you have anything to add in addition to what's already uh, been said, there were a lot of good points made already, of course. Um, one thing that I'd like to emphasize is that during the RFS, um, although it's something that, you know, or medical student council or anything with an SIR, although it looks good on your CV, um, you know, I, that, that's not necessarily something that was brought up in any of my, um, any of my interviews. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how it was perceived. I'm sure it was perceived positive, positively. Uh, but the real value of joining these communities and being involved in leadership in the RFS is really for your own um, for your own benefit. It really plugs you into the community. You get to uh, meet your future colleagues, people you're going to be working with, people that are going to give you job recommendations in the future. Um, it, it's a really great thing uh, for anybody who's seriously interested in IR to be involved with. Um, you will feel welcome in the community. When you go to conferences, there will be people there that you know. Um, it, it really makes the whole application process enjoyable because you will have a community that you will go through this whole experience with. Um, uh, and also something uh, about leadership in general. You know, I was of the mind that, you know, we do some of these things just to fluff our resume. But um, if you look at it from the perspective of a future employer, if they see that you've had a sustained leadership role in an organization, from that they can tell that you can work with other people, um, uh, you can get things done, and you care about contributing to your community. And I think all those things are things that um, any employer will be looking for. And when they're reviewing your application, they're reviewing it um, from the perspective of, you know, do they want to work with this person? So, so I would highly recommend getting involved um, in leadership within RFS and also leadership in other areas within your school. I think this will, it will be very positive for you and it will look great on your application. Wonderful. Um, Michelle, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so um, I wholeheartedly agree with Rana, and I would say um, one thing I did was I kind of worked my way up in terms of leadership uh, at my interest group at school. So I started um, as like a volunteer coordinator, and then I like did more with the research aspect. And then by the end, uh, on my third, in my uh, fourth year, I was the president of the interest group. And so I would say the earlier you get involved, the more um, leadership responsibility you can get and I think that that at least for me was pretty fun to kind of see how I could grow within uh, the interest group and then um, in terms of the how to get involved even if like let's say you apply for the through the application for um, MSC and like for some reason you didn't get into a group or something that you wanted it's okay like that I would still try and just contact somebody within um, the group that you're interested in and they'll find a way to get you involved like 
don't get discouraged if like when you apply for something you don't necessarily get it if you talk to people you will find a way to get get joined into it okay wonderful and if we definitely there's people always trying to get connected and uh, uh megan do you have anything to add in terms of how to get involved or getting the most out of it I think that what Ron and Michelle said is 100% correct. Um, I just want to echo that like it's okay if you don't get um, something that you apply for in the RFS leadership. Um, there's only so many positions. There's way more residency applicant spots. So if you don't get it, it's okay. I didn't get one and I just joined a service line and got involved that way and definitely go to conferences. Um, and that's actually how I got more involved is just by networking at conferences and uh, that I got plugged in that way. So people are willing to kind of get you into the fold. You just kind of have to be a little persistent. And if you don't get it at first, it's okay. You can still match. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I think that's a good take home for, for a lot of these things that, um, I you know, in an ideal world, all of these things are, um, you know, perfect and shiny. but um, in, you know, if everything's not perfect and shiny, there's a way. There's a way that you can uh, still match. You can still go and do what do what you want to do. Um, and with that, um, I know that time is uh, running running short. Uh, I I really enjoyed the um, interplay between um, the panelists and answering um, a single type of question between multiple panelists. In the interest of time, we're going to um, change the format a little bit for the second half, where we're talking about the application itself. So it's going to be a single panelist answering a question about the uh, particular questions on the slide. And then at the very end, the um, other panelists can uh, jump in with any additional thoughts they have. All right, so moving right along to the application trail. Um, so for letters of recommendation, uh, basically uh, this question would be, oh, let's see, this question would be for uh, Michelle uh, specifically. So this would be um, how many um, how many letters would you recommend asking for? What medical specialties would you ask for? Um, how'd you get to know the letter writers? And you know, knowing what you know now, knowing what you know now, um, what advice would you give? Yeah. So um, I am kind of just again, my personality is like I want to be over prepared. So I got way more letters than I probably needed. I think I had. Six uh, or so, and you, the mo most you can put down per application is four. Or, um, so what I ended up doing was I had uh, two IR uh, letters. One was from my away rotation. One was from somebody at my home institution. I had a DR letter uh, because I, I applied not just to integrate at IR but also DR, and so I needed a DR letter. Um, mm -hmm. I also had a vascular surgery letter. I had an internal medicine letter because um, I had a good relationship with uh, that person. And we are also applying for um, an intern year, oftentimes like a transitional year or inter internal medicine or surgery. And so I included that letter within those applications. Um, and then I had a letter from my research mentor who was not involved in IR, but was involved in public health. And that letter was actually very useful um, and one that I got kind of the most positive feedback from. And that was because that person really knew me well and spoke well about me. Um, and mm -hmm. so that to that end, I'd like to emphasize, yes, getting IR letters and DR letters and everything is, is important. I'm not saying don't do it, but get the letter that is going to... Uh, that the person knows you the very best, and that can be within anything. If you did all of the research you've you've done in dermatology, and your dermatology um, attending knows you really well and will write well about you, then choose that person as opposed to an IR guy that you don't really know very well, um, because they're just going to write a generic letter and it's not going to stand out and it's not going to help you in any way. Um, so that's what I would recommend in terms of getting those letters. And so, like I said, the away rotation is a great opportunity. Your home institution is a great opportunity. And don't limit yourself uh, to just radiology field. Okay. So uh, that covered a whole lot of ground. Um, it's wonderful. So uh, then next to the personal statement, 
Oh, this question's for Megan. So knowing what you know now, what 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 advice would you give regarding make, writing your personal statement for ERAS? And do you recommend writing different personal statements for IR versus DR residency programs? So um, I would start out by saying that your personal statement is in no way an opportunity to air your personal information or problems or anything like that. It should just be about why you are an awesome applicant for whatever you're applying to. Um, I applied for IR and DR um, and so I wrote two different personal statements. They were pretty similar um, but they obviously were tailored to um, each program. Um, I didn't want to write the same personal statement for both because I thought that it could be off-putting for the DR program directors but also it's awkward because they'll see both of them and so you know, it's a mm -hmm. fine line to walk, um, but write them together. They should be consistent. Um, and I would just say that your personal statement should be exclusively why you're going to be an awesome resident and why IR is, or DR is perfect for you. And um, just kind of sell yourself. It's not, unless you have a major red flag, like, like now is not the time to talk about adversity that you faced or anything like that. Um, like you don't, don't want to seem like a liability or like a flight risk. So All I right. think All that's right. kind of where I'll leave that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, great. Um, and then another important uh, component of the application. So, you know, it's not just about, you know, your step one and your personal statement in your letters. Um, in general, Shelby, uh, is there anything you wish you had known when you were preparing your ERAS application in, in addition to those other subjects? Um, at this point, I don't think that there was anything I wish I knew because I think a lot of people gave me advice beforehand. Um, one thing I would like to share is that people should take um, a lot of time to curate your hobbies and interests section. That was a topic of a lot of my interview discussions, talking about my dog walking on Rover, or just like your general hobbies, um, because people get sick of talking about all the other IR related things when it's back to back interviews. So it can help differentiate you from other applicants and make you more interesting. Great. Um, whoops. And then for choosing which programs you actually want to apply to, um, so questions for Daryl. Uh, how many, so in, you know, how many programs do you recommend applying to in IR or DR? And, do you basically recommend, would you recommend applying to always, if you're going to apply to IR, apply to DR2 at the same program? And just how should an applicant figure out how many programs that they, sh they should apply to and which programs? Okay, so this is a really good question and something that I've heard different answers from various different program directors. Um, so as far as how many, I can tell you my experience and then I will ask for some help from the other um, panelists just because I've heard so many different answers to this question but so as far as how many programs did I personally end up applying to I applied to and I think that this is so subjective and it really depends on how strong of an applicant you are um, and I think that it's very important to talk to your advisor at school and possibly in IR whatever kind of advisor you have um, to, to make this decision but I applied to I think 38 IR programs um, mostly because I didn't apply to California at all, and that's because I was mm -hmm. an IMG and I didn't want to pay for that extra application kind mm -hmm. of thing. So it was like so personal, you know, um, and it just mm -hmm. depends who you are. Um, I did apply to DR at every place that I applied to IR, um, mm -hmm. and that did not seem like it was a problem to me. I wrote the same personal statement, and I just changed the last paragraph for my DR applications. Um, saying why, you know, I, why DR is important for IR, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, because I felt like I was going to write two different personal statements, and then I felt like that was dishonest, honestly, like, to me. So I just wrote the same one and then changed it a little bit at the end. Um, uh, I only applied to IR, DR, so I had no other specialties. But that, again, is just depends who you are. You know, I had friends who applied to IR and also applied to internal medicine. And sorry, internal medicine as a backup. Um, yeah, so it just depends. Mm -hmm. I applied to 
So 38 IR programs and about 45 DR programs. Everywhere that I applied to IR, I also applied to DR. And then I chose other DR programs based basically on how good their IR programs were because I ultimately wanted to do IR. Um, so as far as question three, um, yeah, again, that's really personal. So it really depends. I, you know, if you don't have any kind of mentor to speak to or any kind of, you know, advisor at your school, then, you know, reach out to one of us and we can kind of hopefully look at your score. You know, all of it comes into play. So it's hard to answer that question, I think. Um, and again, if the other panelists can answer that, please let me know. Um, as far as the most important um, as far as for which programs I was applying. So that's a really good question. And um, I applied to places based on reputation, based on, um, you know, how clinical their residency was, how long, like how established their IR, DR residency was, and, or was it just DR and then, you know, two years of IR and, or was it like a very clinical IR DR program that had been established over multiple years? You know, that was really important to me. Um, I look, I read this, you know, one article that SIR, um, MSC, I think um, a good friend of mine, um, Audrey wrote, she matched at Colorado um, and talks and, you know, PJ Rochon, which is the, he's the PD at Colorado. He helped her with this. And they wrote a lot about what to look into when you're kind of, you know, interviewing and what's important in a program. And I read that article and that, you know, really mattered to me. Um, and it talked mm -hmm. about the clinical time and how much clinic different um, residencies had, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately what it came down to was somebody that, that you know, that, you know, you know, worked to me and it was, you know, I had, it was the connection and how I had the support and really good mentorship there. Um, when I rotated there, somebody said, you know, he, he was just completely honest with me and he said, you know what, you come from a school that's not well known. You have, you know, we've never heard of it. You know, you, you're not the typical strong IR candidate just because of your school name and let us help you. Like we want to help you. This is what you need to do to succeed all of these things. And they were just the most like incredible mentors to me. And so that I wanted to go somewhere that I thought would make me, you know, shine. And I think that that's ultimately how I chose a program. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And I think, wonderful. I think at least uh, when, uh, when uh, at least when uh, I'm applying, I'll be looking for a place that makes me feel supported like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll maybe leave we'll time, maybe time for the other panelists the other to come panelists in at the end. Come in at the end. So moving on, we have um, we the, have the um, question um, about question applying about to the intern year program. And so uh, this question is so, from, uh, from Millie. And, and would, you and would you recommend? Oh, oh, would you recommend, would you recommend uh, specifically doing a program in general surgery versus internal medicine versus transitional year? Uh, how did you pick among the three when you were applying and what were you looking for in an intern year um, and looking at specific programs when you were applying? And how do you think somebody should determine how many intern year programs to apply to? So in terms of the first question, um, I think there's a wide variety, a wide range. Um, lots of program directors really recommend doing a gen surge um, intern year. Um, I personally didn't apply to any internal medicine just because I didn't want a whole year of medicine. Um, so I basically applied to Gen Surge and also TYs. Um, for the TYs that I was looking at, I wanted to have, I guess, more elective blocks so that I would stack up more surgery um, rotations during the electives. Um, I'm just gonna say personally, I feel like having that as a balance is is a good. It's a good like balance to strike having a, a TY that has um, opportunities where you can do more surgery. Um, mm -hmm. But as of for the gen surge end, which is actually uh, what I landed, um, 
you know, it's tougher, but I'm pretty sure you'd get the training that, you know, would make you a better resident and, and in the future, a better, um, fellow or attending, I guess. Um, and I can't really speak as of to how that, that training really makes a difference because I haven't gone through it myself, but, um, I've talked to quite a few attendings and, uh, they seem pretty convinced that, you know, those who have gone through a gen surge intern year come out, I guess, stronger in a certain way than um, folks who went through a TY year or a medicine year. Um, so in terms of picking gen surge programs, um, mine ended up being categorical, so I didn't have a choice. Um, but the programs that I was looking at were mostly at smaller community hospitals. Um, and that way, it was more so with the hopes that you know, I'd get some more OR time, I'd be able to, you know, get some suturing in, kind of have some first assist opportunities. Whereas um, at an academic place, you're mostly doing floor work, um, which isn't, that's also, you know, skills that we do want to learn. Um, but it's just a very different uh, experience, I'd say. Um, mm -hmm. And in terms of how many to apply to, I think I'm kind of, uh, my numbers were kind of abnormal because uh, as a DO, it's kind of, uh, I mean, there are biases, I hate to say, but um, kind of a, at a disadvantage. So I had to apply to, I think, like 20 surgery programs and then 40 TYs. Um, so it kind of varies. I don't know if the other panelists have different numbers, um, mm -hmm. but yeah. Okay. Great. Um, we'll, we'll leave time at the end of this section for other panelists if you have other uh, thoughts or opinions about this topic to, to jump in. Um, thanks, Millie. And next, we'll talk about um, sort of that in-between process. You've submitted your ERAS application, but you haven't heard anything about interviews yet. Um, so asking Catherine, how soon after submitting ERAS do people seem to hear back about interview invitations in IR or DR? And, you know, just based on your experience and uh, other people who are going through the process at the same time, do you think that many programs only offered interviews in IR but not DR or the other way around? And did you have or would you recommend any contact with residency programs in between when you submitted your application and when you received an invitation to interview? Um, so I submitted on, you know, the date opened, I think it was September 15th. Um, and there are some I had heard of, uh, classmates of mine, um, some programs will send, I think they, the ones that have cutoffs will send some earlier um, kind of rejection emails. Um, but otherwise, um, the invitations, uh, I got anywhere from, uh, I think mid-ish late September was when like I got my first couple, um, but they pretty much go for quite a while, especially if there are places, um, you know, some places do not just send you uh, a rejection email, which, you know, is good and bad because you are kind of left ghosted, but also, you know, you uh, may still have a chance at that place should someone cancel their interview later in the application season kind of thing. Um, so it's pretty much, uh, you can hear back, I, I would say mid to late September is probably the earliest. Um, and then, interviews themselves. Uh, the earliest interview I went on was um, mid-October, um, but I think I think some programs uh, start interviewing a little earlier, um, but safe to say I, I didn't hear of anyone who interviewed in September. Um, at least that was my experience with that. Um, and then as far as uh, I think Daryl had also mentioned, um, all of the programs that she got IR interviews also offered DR, and that was the same for me. Um, I applied to uh, 25 IR and got 18 and they uh, offers and they both offered they all offered IR DR um, I didn't have any day where I went and didn't interview with DR staff as well um, mm -hmm. and then uh, and, and the other way around um, I the places that I applied um, to IR I applied to all of their DR programs as well um, and then the places that so I didn't get any that offered me only DR um, it kind of came as a package deal. <laughs> um, and then the places, mm -hmm. obviously, that I applied to DR, because um, I applied to more DR, DRs as well, um, they just obviously offered DR interviews. Um, mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. as far as contact with residency programs, um, I did not contact any residency programs. The only advice, though, I had been at um, a couple panels at SIR where program directors speak. 
Um, and the only thing they had recommended was if you do have a bit of a lower step score and are worried you might have gotten, you know, automatically cut off by like their software that just filters through all of the ERAS applications they get, um, that would be something to, uh, that should prompt a, an email. They said, I think it was the director from Brown and uh, Colorado that both said, um, if you just email them and say, hey, I'm really interested in your program, um, and just kind of explain uh, why you're interested in their specific program and why you're interested in IR and things like that. Um, you know, just to kind of say, hey, um, you know, please look at my ERAS application, I think um, mm -hmm. is the only time I've heard of people um, contacting. Uh, otherwise, um, I don't necessarily know about the couples match, um, but I've, I've heard some people say that if um, they are, um, you know, like if they're the person they're couples matching with has gotten an interview invite and you haven't, I've heard of couples saying that they have then inter uh, emailed the program or the, um, the person who's gotten the inter interview invite would email the program and then also, you know, mention the, the second person in the couple. Um, so those are the only two instances I've heard of in that, in that sense. Um, Can I just add one quick thing? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Um, so, so another instance is, for example, I was an IMG, I would just say if there's anything kind of like, uh, you know, you know, you mentioned already, but if there's anything on your application, like a step one score, a couples match, IMG in my case, or anything like that, that you want to address, then, and you, like, I also agree with someone who said prior that you shouldn't put that in your personal statement because, you know, you don't, like, don't make it negative, you know. That's, this is a good time to just say that and be like, please don't screen me out. I'm awesome. Take a look at my application kind of thing. So. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I couldn't, I can't, that's an excellent way to say it. Um, <laughs> all right. And that was Daryl, by the way, right? Yeah, sorry. I interrupted, I think. No, no worries. No, no, no I was done. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, you're done, Catherine, on this slide? Uh, yeah, yep. <laughs> All right, moving right along. Uh, so preparing for interviews. So um, so uh, for uh, Rana, what do you think is the most important part of preparing for the interview and do you have any suggestions for this preparation process? Sure, um, I think that the most important thing in the interview itself is that you demonstrate good interpersonal skills, um, that you show that you're kind to everyone and you're polished and prepared. Um, in terms of preparing for the interview, it's really important that you do a mock interview um, if your school offers that or schedule something with your friends. Um, that's definitely something that you should do uh, prior to your first interview. You want to get your spiel ready. People are going to ask you, why are you going to IR, why DR? Um, they're going to, you know, the common question is, tell me about yourself. You want to have, um, you know, a one to two minute answer to those kind of prepared and ready in your mind. If there's something that is, you know, a, can be seen, something that can be perceived as a negative thing on your application, you want to be ready to talk about that. Um, and you want to be able to talk about everything you've listed on your application. Uh, you know, sometimes it, it can be difficult. You know, you, you've done 10 research projects and they're going to ask you about one poster that you were the fourth author <laughs> on. Um, mm -hmm. You kind of want to have a couple of lines, maybe a summary that you can prepare for yourself of the things you've done and you've listed that you can review. Um, it, another thing is that uh, even though interviews, uh, it, it may seem like, you know, you're being asked questions and responding, you definitely do have the opportunity to change the line of the conversation. You know, people are open to it. They're not interrogating you. So if there is there are things that speak to your personality and the kind of candidate you are. There, if you can kind of pick out three unique things about you that you want every interviewer to know, or the most important interviewers that you're going to be meet, meeting with to know, it's important to kind of have those in mind, have that spiel ready, and find a way to weave that into the interview itself. Um, and as uh, as many people already mentioned, your hobbies and interests are going to be things that are are going to be the, the major topic of the conversation and interview. So make sure you list those in your ass. If there is 
any sport you do anything daredevilish if you have a family if you spend a lot of time doing art or you know you're a musician you want to list those stuff and you want to be ready to speak very colorfully about all that you know people people rather talk about fun things um, and that's going to be something that is going to set you apart and uh, make you memorable in a really good way um, I, and then also at some, in some interviews, they, uh, they will give you a list of people that will be interviewing you. In those cases, you want to look those people up quickly and just kind of look at the research area and uh, maybe, you know, you'll have an idea of what kind of questions they're going to ask or something that you can ask them. Uh, you're going to be asked a lot on the interview trail what questions you have for me. Um, and you want to have a list of questions ready, a list of generic questions ready that you can ask anybody if they ask you what other questions you have for me. Um, and if you get to know what kind of interviewer um, you have, uh, you might be able to prepare more uh, smarter questions, more specific questions to them that you can ask them. That, and that can make a positive impression. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, Rana, just sort of a follow-up question from the audience. Did you have, how did you approach, or how did you broach your interest in IR during an interview for DR? Or did you not really bring it up? Did, how, what was your, did you have any um, strategy or um, rule of thumb that you used? Yes, I think uh, similar to uh, some of the other panelists, I had one uh, personal statement for both IR and DR, just because you know I felt like it was disingenuous to, um, kind of say I'm a DR only applicant when I wasn't. Um, you, I have noticed that in some programs, the DR uh, department, uh, you know, sometimes doesn't have a very positive view of the, the IR applicants um, in the sense that they feel maybe, you know, we're not going to be excited about the three years that we're going to spend in DR. And, uh, and this is again, very program specific. Um, in those cases, I thought that having done it, rotation in DR helped me. I was able to talk about that and I was able to uh, kind of talk about why I'm really interested in DR and that, that I would have done DR anyways and I understand that there's, um, there are multitudes of fields within DR that are procedural that would have potentially been also a good fit for me had I been exposed to them earlier. Um, so I think it's important to uh, kind of uh, learn more about DR prior to uh, entering the interview um, cycle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I just want to uh, say uh, briefly say I know that it's uh, 9.30 and I appreciate um, everybody sticking around. Um, we just have three more uh, question slides and then one wrap-up slide and then we'll get to questions from the audience just so uh, just so those of you listening in uh, know what's coming up. Uh, the, uh, that was wonderful, Rana. And uh, so we're going to have two slides about the interview day. First slide, uh, questions for Michelle. Uh, for the IR program interviews you attended, you know, was there normally some sort of formal DR component? It sounds like this was pretty common um, based on the previous answers. Um, and then we sort of already broached this topic, but your thoughts in terms of um, when you're interviewing at a DR only program, do you feel like your experience was different than somebody who was interviewing only in DR and really wasn't applying in IR? And then just a sort of a general tip, because we, you know, we only interview so much. Um, did you see any interview pitfalls that might, might cause applicants to leave a bad impression? And do you have any advice for avoiding these? Yeah, so starting with the first question, um, there is typically uh, one day for both DR and IR but not always. There's some programs that it was separated on two days, um, it, and you might not have gotten an interview for both. So that's it was very. There was only one program that that I had that for, and most are integrated in one day, and you just stay longer um, or start earlier. So depending on however that works, um, but you'll be there from like morning till uh, like from maybe seven until five potentially. Um, versus the DR people will leave at like two. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how the structure is, uh, but it's very program specific. For the uh, DR only programs, um, my, my experience with DR versus IR when you apply and like how programs perceive you is similar to Rana. 
it might put you at a disadvantage to get into a DR program um, if you are gung-ho only IR without showing your interest in DR. Um, so just keep that in mind. I'm not, never lie is a very, like, I'm very strongly believe that you shouldn't lie, but um, focus on what you like about DR when you talk about it. Um, and it, you still might get biased against, so just keep that in mind as, as well. Uh, some common interview pitfalls, I would say, is not knowing exactly what it is you're going to say and kind of being wishy-washy. So don't, uh, like, just go in confident. You're, you're going to sell yourself. That's essentially what you're doing. And people tend to like people who know what, what they're interested in and what they want to do. So, like, if there's a question about where you see yourself in the future, obviously nobody can predict the future. But just have some concrete goals of what you want to accomplish. And if you want, you can just state, like, obviously everything can change. But as of right now, this is what I want. And this is what I care about. So that's what I would recommend. Okay, wonderful. And uh, just as a second part for the interview day, um, actually this question is, uh, let's just uh, have Megan answer this question and then um, other folks can jump in at the end. Um, we've already sort of touched on this topic in terms of interview questions that are guaranteed to come up or interview questions that surprised you. Um, so maybe, we'll, maybe the most important question is, um, what, what can applicants do to assess whether this residency program they're interviewing for is a good fit for them? Definitely. So um, I think this is something that's you kind of just know. It sounds crazy, but once you've been on some interviews, like you're definitely going to get to some and know immediately that this is just not your place. And then you're going to get to others and you're going to be like, these are my people. Um, I would definitely recommend talking to as many faculty as you can and um, all the residents and really immerse yourself in that interview day to kind of, I mean, it, that's how you're going to figure that out. But um, if there are certain things that are particularly important to you, like if you really like to do outdoorsy things or it's really important to you that your residency like program is a very cohesive group and they all hang out together, you know, you can ask specifically about things like that because, you know, different programs have different vibes. Um, but it's kind of something you just know <laughs> mm -hmm. and outside of you know certain thing when certain things are really important to you it's I don't really have a whole lot of advice I don't know if anyone else does but I don't think there's like a magic question I think it's like very personal um, and it's very applicant dependent so I just kind of okay. knew okay um that just strikes you and then uh, this is our last question before we do our, our wrap up of, of this section with the panelists. So uh, this question's, um, let's have uh, Millie answer this question if you would. Um, so what would, it's basically talking about after you've interviewed and when you're deciding about ranking. So did you have any contact with residency programs um, between your interview and your submission of your rank list um, or would you recommend that? And then what was most important to you when you were deciding which programs to rank highly? And do you have any advice in terms of um, ranking programs that are IRD or com um, combination programs versus DR only? So for me, after interviews, um, I sent my interviewers thank you emails, um, just very brief, um, maybe like three sentences max. Um, and then prior to submission of my rank list, once I had my top three figured out, um, I actually used that same email thread um and just basically hit reply uh to the program directors of the top three places um just to let them know that you know that i'll be ranking them highly that actually is a very tricky thing to kind of go around because i think for your number one program it's easy to say oh you're my number one but kind mm -hmm. of figuring out the wording for your like number two and number three um mm -hmm. that can get tricky um mm -hmm. Yeah, and then in terms of how I decided how to uh, rank my programs, uh, I think Megan had kind of touched upon this, but it was more so like on interview day or on your rotation, you know, did you did I click with these people? Did I click with the residents, with um, the attendings? Um, and to me, it was mostly about the vibe that I got, because um, if you don't click with if you think a group is weird, like you're going to be spending at least five years with them, then that's a lot of time. Um, 
And then other factors that kind of came into play was, you know, location um, and the variety of cases that were available. And also uh, I kind of looked into how much hands-on experience and uh, autonomy the fellows had, um, Mm -hmm. the current fellows have, because certain programs were a little bit more um, attending heavy in terms of procedure wise. Um, whereas other programs were very like hands off, the fellows, you know, got to scrub in and take their cases. So kind of, there's a wide range. Um, and hopefully, um, yeah, everyone kind of has their own priorities and kind of like figuring that out for yourself is important. Um, and then in terms of how I rank my programs, um, I definitely stacked the my top favorite IR programs first. Um, and then I had DR programs that I had really enjoyed and they were also very strong in their IR experience. So mm-hmm. I had then put those behind um, my IR ones. And then I had a couple of IR ones that were like, to me kind of like in the middle, like I didn't love it, didn't hate it. Um, mm-hmm. So I kind of scattered that um, in, you know, the afterwards, um, with the, the rest of my DR programs that I thought were just okay. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I would definitely say that, you know, have a good dis, uh, distribution of maybe like a third of the programs that you thought were kind of above your reach, a third that are within your reach and then a third that are safety. Cause not matching is also horrible and I've had classmates who didn't match and it's kind of a, it's extremely painful to watch. Um, so kind of when you're deciding whether or not you want to rank this DR or IR program, um, you're kind of in that decision process of, you know, would I rather not match or would I Mm -hmm. stick it out for this program for like, you know, five or six years. So. Yeah. You're bringing up a lot of really important things that we don't always talk about. Um, and so I, I don't mean to, um, I didn't mean to rush the second half. You all have given such really insightful and specific advice. Um, I do want to give everybody the opportunity to, to share their thoughts on a topic that maybe they didn't speak about on a particular slide regarding the application process. Um, so this is, uh, this is the slide for that. So if you have, um, anything else that you wanted to add to what's been said before, uh, that maybe you didn't get to speak about. Uh, this is a slide for it. If if there isn't anything, that's fine also. Um, starting with Megan. Um, one little tidbit that I have is everyone talked about the Kandarpa book, which is awesome, and I use it on all my ways. But if you buy it, um, you can like use a little scratch off code, and you can actually download it onto your cell phone, which I thought was really helpful because I didn't have to like lug that book around. Because although it is small, it doesn't really fit in your scrub pocket, and it like. I don't know. It can be cumbersome. So, um, and then also you can get Kaufman's book. I forget what it's called, but just Kaufman's IR book mm-hmm. is good too. Um, it tells you about like just really basic stuff that someone might not ever teach you. So that's it. Thank you so much, Lana. This has been really great. Yeah. Thank you, Megan. Um, well, and I'll give you all a formal thank you at the end as well. Um, Shelby, do you have any uh, sort of key advice, uh, other 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 burning advice that you really think uh, people applying should know? Sure. Um, Just to touch on something we talked about earlier, the contact with institutions, maybe you haven't heard from them, you know other people have gone an interview. I did reach out to some programs and I got, I think, two interviews after reaching out via email, um, Mm -hmm. just emphasizing to them that I am from that home state or have ties in the area or specific reasons why I was very interested in that program. And then they'll take another look at your application and it's just worth a shot. I would wait a decent amount of time until you send that email. Um, but just so you all know that it is possible. And then I also did send some follow-up handwritten thank you notes after interviews um, and also sent letters to my top three. It is a fine line for sure. I told my top one that they're my top one and then the other mm-hmm. ones I just said you're in my, you're highly ranked, you're in my top choices. Um, mm-hmm. But I do think it's something that you should consider just because it's so competitive and they want to know that you are equally as interested in them. Once you, if you, but once you decide who your top one is, don't go back on that because um, it's a small community and they definitely want to make sure that you're being truthful when you send them a letter like that. 
And then finally, one thing I learned on the um, interview trail, I didn't get a letter from one attending at my institution, and then I was in a certain state, and a lot of the um, hospitals there kept mentioning this attending. And so mm -hmm. I thought to myself it would have been smart to work with that doctor more to be able to get a letter from them if you kind of if you think about it and you try to be more strategic um, because those doctors at that institution would have valued a letter from that attending because they trained with her and they would have known her. Um, so it's mm -hmm. just something I thought I could have utilized more. You can kind of target your letters to different institutions based on who might know other people. Something to keep in mind. But that's it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Daryl, any any um, last minute advice for um, our applicants or our future applicants? I think that Megan and Shelby really hit it on the head. All right. The nose, sorry. <laughs> the nose. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, uh, Millie, do you have anything you'd like to add? Any um, any last uh, advice, take home advice for the applicants or the new batch of applicants? So, uh, kind of a little bit random, but one tip that I got from uh, a previous uh, resident was that um, to set up a separate email account for ERAS, um, I had classmates who were checking their phones every time their phone buzzed for an email, um, but I had a separate email for it, a separate vibration and separate ringtone for it, so I knew when um, like invites came out, like I knew that this is what I want to respond to like ASAP. Um, so that really kind of helped calm the stress down for me um, when it came to invites. Um, and I also have actually already uh, a video that's out on YouTube. It's actually geared towards my home institution, but I think it's there's a lot of things that are applicable to other um, applicants. Um, so if you just want to Google navigating through Western U ERAS, um, that'll pop up and, and that's just stuff on my own um, tips and my own process that, you know, for ERAS. Oh, that's wonderful. And, and also, Millie, I don't know if you have the link uh, available right away. You can, if you would, you could share it with um, the entire audience via the chat. Um, I know a lot of people would be really interested. Okay, sure. Thanks. Um, and Catherine, any, any take home advice for applicants? Yeah, um, I think, um, you know, everything that's been said, I think kind of has been along the lines of just, this is a really personal kind of thing for each and every one of us. Um, and I think one piece of advice that kind of helped me stay grounded was to really consider your own personal priorities. Um, you know, do you want to do research or not? Do you just, you know, having family in the area of your work, uh, you know, is that something that's important to you, your hobbies, the weather? I mean, um, just remember in a lot of these times, uh, getting advice from people is great, but it, it does kind of uh, get confusing, to be honest, um, especially going on these interviews. You really sell yourself and sell the fact that you want to be at that place on your interview day, which is exactly what you should be doing. But I mean, remember that it is your life. And when you, you know, are coming to think about how you rank things and where you really want to go and what you prioritize, um, don't kind of let the the cloud of what you should do or what you think other people are telling you to do, um, you know, cloud that because, uh, you know, it's, it's very stressful and just stay grounded in your priorities. And I think things will work out in your favor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, a great point. Um, we, we have, we definitely have this webinar because we, you know, we all are curious about the process and we want to make sure that we, you know, don't miss something because we didn't realize to do it. But at the end of the day, we, all want to apply to IR and have our application be all that it can be because we want to practice IR. We want to be good IR doctors someday. So I think that's a, a great point. Um, uh, Rana, do you have anything to add? Uh, take home advice for applicants. Uh, can you guys hear me? Sorry, I think my audio cuts in and out. Uh, we can hear you okay. Excellent. Um, my only advice uh, that hasn't been talked about is that, uh, you know, especially in OA rotations, it's really important that you are very kind and respectful towards your peers that are on the, you know, that are also doing a ways. Um, you know, I think sometimes people, you know, you invest a lot of time and energy. Um, and as Millie said, you're very tired as you're trying to you know, be your best self on these a ways. And I think it's really important to know that 
um, that even though you know your peers uh, may not be getting you this job, they're going to be your colleagues forever, and it's and you don't want anyone walking away from the experience and talking negatively about um, their experience with you. So I would definitely keep that in mind um, as you're as you go on uh, to do always during fourth year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and then to to round us off, um, Michelle, do you have any any take home advice uh, or la last word? Um, yes. For the panel? So I will speak quickly. Uh, one thing I want to realize, I want people to realize, like this is six years, and this is kind of a time in a lot of people's lives um, that you might be like wanting to start a family or like depending on whatever your priorities are. Keep in mind that it's six years, and so um, having support like family nearby. Uh, can be helpful for whatever point in your life you're at. So um, I think a lot of people do take that into consideration. So just keep that in mind. Uh, for uh, One thing is step one is important and people get really scared about it. And I just want people to not be so fearful that you go crazy. Do the very best you can. Yes, it is an important part of this process. I cannot sugarcoat that. But um there are ways to, to make it work. And, and you, know, you, can't change, you can't control the future. Um, and you can't, like, you don't know what's going to happen. So there's no point in worrying about it. Just do what you can. And afterwards, whatever the result is, it, you'll find a way to make it the best for you. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is one thing that you may want to, this is a strategy uh, concept that, like, you can take as you wish. If you're a weaker candidate, it might be worthwhile to consider just applying for DR and going the ESIR route um, instead of uh, applying for both IR and DR. And the reason I say that is I found that people who were maybe not as strong applicants um, who applied to both were kind of put at a disadvantage for getting interviews for DR programs. Just this is from my own experience. Um, and the people who just applied DR, even though they knew they wanted to do IR someday, got more of those DR interviews. That's just my experience, so something to consider depending on what your application looks like. Um, last thing, sorry that I have so many points, but uh, the know. Student Factor Network Forum also um, is something that was very active in this application cycle, and people wrote a lot of things and put updates as to like when um, interviews went out. And, um, it was helpful uh, for, for me, but people also go crazy checking it like constantly and getting worried. Oh my God, I didn't get an interview. Uh, just be grounded. Realize that just because you didn't get an interview on that first wave or whatever doesn't mean that you're not going to get an interview. And um, that might also give you an indication when it's a good time to start emailing program directors uh, to let them know, uh, look, I'm like really interested. Can you take a look at my application one more time? Um, so that is something that I recommend. Um, and then for the intern year, most people, um, most program directors recommend doing a surgery intern year. My perspective on it was similar, um, that it's possible. Uh, I think you can, you have a lot of flexibility doing a transitional year, but if you end up doing a transitional year and then you want, and then you go into DR thinking you're going to do ESIR, just realize it may or may not Put you at a disadvantage to have that transitional year when you apply for that independent year, uh, independent IR uh, application. So just keep that in mind. It might strengthen your application to be to have a surgery year if you're going the ESIR route. So that's it. Can I just can I? Sorry, can I say something quickly? Yeah, absolutely. This is Daryl, right? Uh -huh. Yes. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I just wanted to say that. Also, I mean, I agree with everything that everyone said, but I also think that like the interview trail was such an amazing opportunity to meet people in the field, kind of like what um, Rana said earlier about joining RFS and SIR and getting to know your peers and, and, and your, you know, mentors, people in the field. The interview trail, I got to see like some, inc so many incredible programs and meet so many incredible faculty. If you can, try not to cancel your interviews and like go on these interviews and meet these people because it's an incredible experience. Well, um, it gives us it gives us something to look forward to as much um, 
I'm a, I'm a fourth year and I know I'm feeling some anxiety about the application trail, but that, that paints it in a much friendlier light. Um, and one last thing um, mm -hmm. on that note, don't be afraid to update programs throughout the entire process. Like even after I had interviewed at programs, I found out that I um, got accepted for my SIR abstract. I was going to be giving an oral presentation at SIR. So those are like big things to update programs about because in the end, you want to impress them so that they'll rank you. So just update them with any like notable changes in your application. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this this was Shelby, right? Yes, that's Shelby. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, is anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, this is Michelle again. Just remember that you guys are awesome. It's it's like easy to get discouraged and like struggle through this time, but it, you guys are awesome no matter what and whatever you do, whether or not it's IR, you're gonna make it great, and we're gonna be doctors. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> exactly. And you get the opportunity to like, finally people are like trying to get you, which is the most incredible thing. Like all through medical school, you're like sucking up and getting letters of rec and what do you have to do to do to make it, you know, and finally people are shopping for you in a way, you know, so it's, it's a really cool. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it's a real different experience and um I want to thank you all. Um, on that note, I know that it's um, it's been a long it's been a long webinar. We've covered a lot, and I know that uh, you know I'm so happy that so much of the time spent in the webinar was listening to um, your guys as the panelists' um, opinions and thoughts. You shared so many um, so much good advice that makes me feel better, and also gives me an idea of very specific things that I should be thinking about. So, um, as a fourth year, and also somebody who's been thinking about IR for a couple years, you know, and you have that you know how do I get involved and all of that, I feel like you guys covered a lot of ground in a very um, in a very helpful way. So, um, actually, in the interest of time, I think we're going to um, pass over the um, question and answer session. But if anybody in the audience has any questions uh, for the panelists, what you can do is you can go, um, you can send uh, me an email. So that's at sir.msc.education@gmail.com. And I can forward your email to um, panelists you're interested in, and that way, um, you know, if they're if they're if they're able, um, have anything, uh, any advice they want to offer, um, we can do that. So really, uh, this is the end of the webinar. What I really want to make sure to do is thank our panelists. Um, you know, these these are uh, medical students who have graduated and they're getting ready to start their intern years, and they've taken uh, the time, extra time in this case, to share their share their experience with us and to really i feel like they give us a very um open open honest um and positive opinion of this whole process so i really want to thank our panelists um, i also want to quickly thank uh, chris malloy lauren park and Aaron mcbride for helping with this uh webinar i know it was um much improved with their help um, and so the meeting is going to be recorded so you can find it on the rfs youtube channel and um so with that, I'd like to adjourn the meeting and thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you, Sana. Thank you and good luck, everyone. Yep, good luck. Thank you, best of luck. Thank you. All right, good night. <laughs>